So good evening and welcome to tonight's event, NASA and Aberdeen Human Exploring Mars. Today's event, you will notice, is recorded and we will be making it available on YouTube as soon as the event is over. It will be hosted on the TechFest Aberdeen channel, Aberdeen Science Centre, and also we'll be promoting it through our NASA and Aberdeen social media channels. So if you know anybody who has missed tonight's talk, you'll be able to make that um, aware for them to be able to share, but also if you want to watch it back. Something else that we're doing quite special with this project to to establish us to have that educational link as well is that the questions and answers that you take part and the following feedback that you have will be also recorded into a video that we'll be able to share as well to really uh, support our, our our colleagues in education on behalf of TechFest and aberdeen science center we are delighted to welcome you here to this evening's presentation by our educational partner in the nasa and aberdeen project the institute of physics we hope that we get back to normal soon and that we are able to have our visiting uh, NASA astronaut and engineers over from America to visit us. But in the meantime, we wanted to take this opportunity to celebrate the most extraordinary innovation and discovery that is happening on Mars as we speak. If you have any questions this evening, please can you use the question and answer box as this is the easiest way for us to answer as many of your questions. If your question is from a junior member, member of our audience this evening, if you could indicate that as we will try to answer those questions first. Uh, just to keep them them uh, not hopefully up not 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 too late if we have any technical issues please do bear with us if you get kicked out we'll be able to to bring you back in and if the worst thing happens and we have a full shutdown you'll be emailed the updated link and um, to be able to get back and normal service will 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 resume hopefully now that i've said all of that everything will uh, will be will be perfect. Tonight's speaker is going to take us on a journey of the human exploration of Mars. Tim Browett is a member of the IOP, the Institute of Physics here in Scotland, and is an experienced public speaker, teacher and trainer of physics and astronomy. He has delivered talks and workshops for the National Space Academy, the Association for Science Education, the Aberdeen Astronomical Society, Robert Gordon's College and many others. For his education and public engagement work, he was in fact awarded the Sir Patrick Moore Medal in 2017 by the Royal Astronomical Society and is a proud and dedicated science geek. Before I hand over to the, Tim though, I'd just like to take a minute to thank all of the sponsors here shown on the screen for their long-term support for the project and in particular BP to CNOC, to Equinor, to TACA, to Apollo and also to Oceaneering for their, for their support. Over to you Tim, thank you very much. Thank you and good evening everyone, thank, so glad you could join us. Uh, I'm just going to put my slides up on the screen. I should be up there now. Okay, so as Sarah just said, this is our NASA in Aberdeen talk for humans exploring Mars. My name is Tim Brower and I'm from the Institute of Physics. Uh, there will be a Q&A options at the end, so if you've got any questions, do feel free to put them in the chat during the session and we'll try and pick them up. Uh, at the end. If they're coming from any of the many young people we have joining us this evening, please do put their name and age in so I can make sure that I'm answering the question at the right sort of level and can give them a shout out. This is the NAPS in Aberdeen project, which is run for four years uh, with the title of Inspiring the Next Generation. We have been very fortunate to have funding to enable a NASA engineer and NASA astronaut to visit us uh, over the years and give a series of public talks, schools talks, uh, and then I've been involved in the teacher training element that has run parallel with that. So I'm sort of changing uh, lanes as it were a little bit this evening, but hopefully uh, you'll all learn some stuff. I'm not going to have any advanced physics in it, so nothing to worry about at this stage. As Sarah said, we've had many sponsors which have enabled this to happen, so a big thank you to all of those. Uh, they've been quite modest, so they haven't thanked Aberdeen Science Centre and Tech Fest, so I'll do that. Um, seeing Rob Gordon's college logo there reminds me to give a big shout out to all the teachers across Scotland and in other places that have been working so hard to keep educating all our young people. So I hope you have a good weekend after this, you definitely deserve it. So I'm going to start off with a wee clip. Now this is by a guy called Sean Duran, who doesn't work for NASA. As far as I know, he's not actually employed to create these videos but it seems to be a hobby that he must spend a huge amount of time doing. Now, at the start of this video, you had an astronaut standing on top of what you can now see is a giant mountain. This is Mars. We don't have any people on Mars yet, uh, but this data, other than the, the astronaut, which was CGI, the rest of it is actual real data. 
We've got quite a number of orbiting spacecraft that have been able to take quite high resolution imagery of almost the entire surface of Mars. And he has spent an extraordinary amount of time downloading that, processing it to generate these kind of videos. So he did kindly let me use it to start off this evening's talk. Uh, so I will give him a wee plug and say thanks for that. Uh, he has a YouTube channel. And at the end of the session, when we start the q and I'll post a link to that in the chat, along with some other links I'll mention through this evening. Uh, if you've got, if you want to just have some really awesome looking space imagery running in the background, uh, if you've got an office space, go for it. If you just want to switch off and just look at the amazing universe that we have around us, then again, it's really great for that. Uh, let's start off talking about Mars with this animation. Hopefully you can see near to the middle is the planet Mars traveling in a bit of a strange path. Uh, it started going one way across the screen, it slowed down, looped back on itself, slowed down again, and it's now carrying on in the original direction. In case you missed it, I'll play that again. Now, this is happening over a series of months. So if you look at the night sky and take photos of it, and then look at those photos like through a flick book, uh, you'd notice that Mars is moving very different to everything else. Almost everything in the night sky, the stars are all fixed. The wanderers, of which Mars is one of them, moves in a very peculiar way. And this weird loop that it does really made it stand out to ancient civilizations. So about 3,000 years ago, the ancient Chinese, ancient Egyptians, and the Mesopotamians uh, all had records of them studying Mars, trying to figure out why it was different to most of the rest of the night sky. Uh, Mesopotamia, where many of you probably won't know where that is, uh, that would include the regions now that we would have as Iraq, Syria, and many other uh, areas in that region as well. If we skip forward another thousand years, we get to 2000 years ago, uh, where we have many of the ancient Greek philosophers. Uh, and these are really the individuals that give us a lot of the maths, astronomy, and other sciences, or the beginnings of it, that we would tend to recognize. So where does the name Mars come from? Well, it comes from the ancient Greeks, or more to the point, the Romans. Both the Greeks and Romans had a god of war. The Greeks called him Ares, and the Romans called him Mars. Now, Mars the planet was named after Mars the god because it did its own thing. It travels in this weird loop. It's independent of the masses of stars. Also, given its color, resembling both fire and blood, seemed fitting descriptors for the god of war. Now, astronomology, or some random word like that. Basically, what I've done there is I've bashed together the two words astronomy and astrology, because way back then, thousands of years ago, they were the same thing. These, these, these days, we've unpicked the two to be two completely separate things. Astronomy is a scientific study of the cosmos, looking at how the universe works, applying our understanding in a mathematical way to be able to make predictions and things like that. Whereas astrology is a belief system based on celestial objects being able to influence human actions. Now, a lot of people aren't aware of sort of the, the ancient Islam or the, the Middle Ages Islamic scientists that did actually a lot of the early work on astronomy. So we've jumped from the ancient Greeks and Romans 2000 years ago to being only about 800 years ago. Uh, and I've never had someone tell me how to pronounce this name, so I will pronounce it my own way very badly. Uh, Yacoub Ibn Tariq. Uh, he is recorded in, I think it's about 800 AD as having made an estimate for the diameter of Mars. Now he came out with an estimate of it being, or he, he thought it was a measurement, but his value was nine and a half times the size of Earth, where it's actually substantially smaller than Earth. So within an order of magnitude, he was there, but still uh, needed a bit of work. But given the tools that he had back then, that's still quite an impressive feat. Next, we have Muhammad Im Musa al Quizami. And he calculated the movements of the sun, the moon, and the five planets, and was able to make actually quite accurate predictions as to where you should be able to look in the sky to see them on any given night. So the work he was doing hundreds of years ago is what we now have software to be able to do for us. So the animation I showed you at the beginning of this, where we had Mars traveling in its weird loop, uh, that is basically running on calculations similar to what he would have been doing hundreds of years ago. 
Next, we have Monsieur Aldin Altusi. Uh, he was a true polymath. Now, I'm going to guess that most of the young people in the audience don't know what that means. A polymath is basically someone that's really, really good at lots and lots of stuff. So he was good at physics, he was good at astronomy, he was good at maths, he was good at agriculture. He really understood a lot of things. He's, he basically spent his days thinking through problems and coming up with solutions to them. Now, one of the things he did was actually refine the planetary models that were in existence then. So he tweaked things to have better understanding of how things worked and came up with something called the Tusi couple, which you can see a little animation of a circle in a circle. Don't need to know it in too much detail, but the circle in a circle concept of being able to explain the motions of planets was actually then taken up by Copernicus. So there's a lot of debate in academic circles as to whether Tusi came up with the original idea and Copernicus then borrowed it to build on or whether it was an independent idea of Copernicus's. Now we get to some of the European uh, Enlightenment era or Renaissance scientists and astronomers that you may be familiar with. On the very left, we have Copernicus, who revol revolutionized astronomy by coming up with a more sustainable and workable heliocentric model. Now, heliocentric just is a fancy way of saying that everything goes around the sun in our solar system. So it's what we would have learned at school, uh, but it's quite a contrast to what they had learned up to that time. Generally, people had believed because we don't feel the earth moving, they believe the earth wasn't moving. And in fact, it was the heavens. So the stars and the planets and the sun that was then moving around us. It's very easy to see how that matches our initial perceptions. But there were some things that could be explained easier and more accurately if you accept that, yes, the sun is the center of the solar system. The guy in the middle is Johannes Kepler. Now he took Copernicus's idea and built on it and came up with a really solid mathematical foundation for how that all worked. Uh, part of it being the acceptance that not all the planets travel in nice neat circles they actually travel in ellipses which is a fancy word for saying an oval shape the guy that we then have on the very right is galileo galilei now he's famous for lots of different things but in astronomical circles he's most well known for using a telescope to look to the heavens and see different things he studied the sun he studied venus he studied mars and he studied the moon so he has some of the earliest observational recordings of detailed analysis of the Mar sorry, of Mars. We jump ahead a bit uh, and we get to uh, William Herschel. Now, William Herschel did huge amounts of astronomy, but one of the things he thought was looking at the different planets was he was, as with many of his peers at the time, believed that actually there was life all over the solar system. He thought they were Martians, he thought they were Venusians, he thought they were different um, races or beings on different planets. He then used his telescope to look at Mars in more detail and draw diagrams like the one on the left, the one labelled A. So he saw that there was these contrasting colours and he was trying to be able to explain them. So he used his telescope to repeatedly observe overlapping sections, and that's what each of those circles is trying to represent, so that he could try and get a better understanding of what was going on. Now, if we use modern instruments, so we actually have satellites orbiting around Mars at the moment, and if we use their special cameras to analyse the surface at the poles, what we find is that there are actually polar ice caps. Now, these are quite different to the ice caps that we have on Earth. Uh, for a start, Mars is a particularly dry planet, not completely, but compared to Earth, definitely very dry. And this ice is not water ice, it's actually carbon dioxide. So the gas which you breathe out, you breathe out more of after you've been doing exercise, actually, if it gets super, super, super cold, it can turn to a form of ice. Now, we tend to call that ice dry ice because when it melts, it doesn't leave a puddle like water does. It actually goes straight from being a solid ice cube to evaporating as a gas. Oh, and I'll just point out those black regions aren't like a sinkhole. It's not like water going down a plug in a sink. Uh, there's just the part of the animation where we don't have enough data to be able to model what's there very well. Next, we have Giovanni Scaparelli. Now, he studied Mars with a much better telescope than anything that had gone before. And in doing so, he created a map like we have here. And he saw that there were these lines, not necessarily straight lines, but he did think of them as lines. 
And in Italian, he would call them channels, but sorry, channels, but he would call that in Italian canali. Now, when he wrote up his research and talked about these canali, that was translated into multiple languages so scientists around the world could appreciate what he had done. And one of those scientists was Percival Lull. He is an American, or was an American astronomer. And when he got his translated copy, instead of saying channels, they said canals. And that gave to him the idea of them being in straight lines and being created by some sort of sentient being. So because they thought that there was ice at the poles and it seemed a fairly dry and barren landscape, it's the color of rust because actually that's mostly what it is, iron oxide. Um, he looked at this and thought, right, so they've got water at the poles and they're using these giant canals to provide irrigation systems and be able to pass water from different regions of the planet to where it's needed. So he looked through his telescope and these are the drawings of what he saw. Now, there's a bit of a problem with the way that the human brain works in that if you think something is there, you're much more likely to see it. Now, this ties into a whole bunch of different things, but if ever on a nice day, you've been staring at the clouds and you might see a shape, you might see a teddy bear or a Pikachu. And if someone else is looking at those same clouds, they might see completely different things or they might see nothing at all. But if you say to them, oh, look, that cloud looks like Pikachu, then they're much more likely to say, you're right, it does, because they've been conditioned to expect to see that sort of a thing. Now, this man, Werner von Braun, he was one of the most influential people in getting humankind to space. Uh, in the earlier part of his life, he actually worked for the Nazis during World War II to build the biggest rocket bombs that would travel huge distances and blow up their enemy. Not a great reputation, um, but at the end of the war, he wasn't interested in building bombs. What he was interested in was being an engineer. Uh, and so actually, he went to the States and helped them to take his ideas for rockets, which the Germans had used for bombing their enemies, and turn those into the rockets for getting satellites, satellites, and eventually people up into space. Now, when he left Germany, a lot of his materials were still left behind, and the Soviets then came and found all of these. So they sort of took his documents, took his equipment, understood what he was doing, and that's how the Soviets then developed their stream of getting to space. Now, I'm going to jump ahead uh, into the 1900s. Uh, sorry, no, no, jump ahead a little bit, sorry, into the 1960s. Uh, and we're going to have one of the biggest face palms ever. And this was a mistake. So imagine the scene. We've got rockets. We're taking people up to space. We've got rockets going even further to Mars. Uh, we've done a couple of flybys. We had Mariner 4, which was the first flyby of Mars. And that showed that Mars was a completely dead planet, very dry, cratered. So there wasn't too much geology or that sort of thing happening at the moment. And we wanted more information. So we sent this other craft. Now, the craft was called Mars Climate Orbiter because it was supposed to be, as the name says, an orbiter. So we sent it all the way to Mars and it got there and then something went wrong. And what happened was the different components of the systems were talking to each other in different languages. Now, it's all numbers, but what the language of the numbers was talking about was measurements. And some of the measurements were in metric, so things like meters and kilometers and other things were imperial, so yards and miles. Now, it wasn't quite for distances, but that sort of thing. And these two systems were talking to each other and completely misunderstanding each other. And so they thought they were a lot further out than they were, so they made their adjusting maneuvers. And instead of going into orbit at a nice safe altitude of 226 kilometers orbiting around Mars, they had accidentally dropped down to 57. And that meant they actually hit the atmosphere going incredibly fast and they either bounced off it, a bit like skimming a stone over water, or they burnt up as the most expensive shooting star in history. Now, this picture I'm not expecting you to look at in a huge amount of detail. It's a very busy diagram, I'll admit. Uh, but what this is trying to show is over time, how many different missions we've sent to Mars. So this first section going from sort of the 12 o'clock position around to the three is the 1960s. And this is where there was a big rush between the Soviets and America to find out about Mars. It was a bit of prestige about being the person that had found or the nation that had found these things out. So they sent quite a lot of craft in that time, again, a lot more in the 70s. 
Now, whenever you do something that is so ridiculously difficult for the first time, you tend to have a lot of fails. So Mars has this reputation for being incredibly difficult to get to. And actually more than almost half of the missions have failed, depending on kind of how you count them. Uh, whoops, jumped ahead a bit there. Uh, so that's if we look at the entire time that we've been trying to get things to Mars. But given how many young people we have with us this evening, let's say we only count everything happening from the year 2000. So instead of having 20 different fails, if we count all the missions from the year 2000, so it's kind of this last third of the wheel, then things look dramatically different because there's only three failures. One was a total failure, and that one was this one. This was Phobos Grunt, which was done by the Russians, uh, and it failed to actually leave Earth's orbit. So they got it on the rocket, they got it up out of the Earth's atmosphere, but the command to tell it to stop going round and round Earth and shoot off instead to Mars didn't work. So it basically went round Earth lots and lots of times until it ran out of the ability to make its adjustments to maintain that altitude, and instead it became, again, a very expensive shooting star. The next two missions that failed were actually partial failures, and both were done by the European Space Agency. So the European Space Agency sent an orbiter to Mars. It got into orbit, it was going around fine. It then deployed its lander, and that lander was called Beagle 2, uh, and that was a UK-led operation. Lots of excitement in the UK for this happening at the time. Uh, and basically, we knew it deployed OK, and then we never heard from it again. So after lots and lots of searching, in fact, 11 years later, they found it. So this gray image that we've got here, we've managed to get enough light reflecting off it for the images on an orbiter to actually, sorry, the camera on an orbiter to actually take the image of it. And you can see that there's these two little nodules on one side of it. Now, the image on the right is what they think the craft looks like based on the image on the left. So the way the craft worked, it had sort of two components that folded out, and then one of them had these solar panels which folded out like petals. And as you can see, one of the petals has stayed uh, in rather than folding out, and that's actually stopped the antenna being able to get up and be able to broadcast any information. The next one, very, very grainy image here, but this is, this was, sorry, a lander named after Scaparelli, which we talked about earlier, the guy that had discovered the lines or the, the channels, as he was trying to call it, uh, on Mars. Uh, so ESA sent another orbiter. This one was the trace gas orbiter. It got into Mars, was going fine. It dropped down its lander. And again, we had a glitch. Now, this one wasn't human error. It seems to have been a hardware fault. But one of the systems said, oh, we've touched down, turned the engines off. Unfortunately, it did that while it was still more than three kilometers up in the air. So this thing came hurtling down at a great rate of knots and created a new crater on Mars. If ever you want to see what NASA is doing at the moment, uh, you can go onto something called the Deep Space Network. And this is all their big satellite dishes uh, around the world. They've got a base in Madrid, another one in Goldstone, another one in Canberra. And between these three, you can basically listen to satellites anywhere in the solar system at any time. Uh, and what you can actually do is go on and see which satellites are actually talking to NASA at the moment. Are they downloading data? So we could actually potentially go on to here one day and see, oh, Perseverance is, is sending data to NASA. I wonder what that's going to be. Is it going to be some new exciting images and things like that? Another thing you can use is something called NASA Eyes. Now, this is, again, it's an online website and links to all of these, by the way, as I said, I'll share in the description below, or if you're watching it live tonight, then I'll put them in the chat, uh, the Q&A at the end. So you can go on here and you can search up Mars or the moon or one of the moons of Jupiter or Mars or whatever you want, and you can zoom in and you can see it in detail. And what you actually get to see is what craft we actually have on there at the moment. So in the middle of our screen almost, we have the Trace Gas Orbiter. That's one of the European ones. We've got Mars Odyssey up above. We've got Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter down below. And you can actually see what the different craft are doing, where they are, and things like that. Now, around Mars, actually, I should just say briefly, on the last image, there's two craft that I know that are there that we can't see on that animation. Uh, that animation is updated in real time by NASA. So 
what you're actually seeing is literally where those craft are now. Uh, you can equally use it to go and look where they were in the past, or you can look to where it's predicting they'll be in the future. But it doesn't have all the data in there. Now, this uh, image is something called the Hope Orbiter, uh, and this is the first time the Emirates have sent a craft to Mars. Uh, so they did really well on their first attempt getting something to orbit Mars. We also have China, who China had a little piece on the Phobos Grunt mission that I said didn't manage to leave Earth's orbit. Uh, so the next time they went for it, they went big. So this is a bit like those nested dolls you get. First of all, you had a giant rocket take off and out of it came this craft. Uh, the solar panels would have been folded up at the time to make it fit into the fairing. And it's then traveled all the way to Mars. It's had these solar panels out to get energy during its journey. It's now again, gone into orbit around Mars, it's going round and round, and it's actually analyzing the surface in a lot of detail. Because this top gray section that looks rather like the capsules that Apollo used or even the Soyuz capsules is effectively that. This, is, this top gray section will come off of the satellite and then be allowed to travel down through to Mars to go through entry, descent, and landing. Uh, out of it will pop a lander and then if the landing goes okay, off the lander will then come a trundling rover. So it's quite a complex mission because it's three different things all trying to get to Mars and analyze it in different ways. So really looking forward to the data that comes back from this. Uh, the Chinese take a slightly different approach though to the Americans at NASA because they tend to keep what information they have quite secretive. So if it goes really, really well, they say, look, here's something, aren't we awesome? Whereas America is much more this is what we're going to try and do. We hope it's awesome. Come along with us for the journey, which makes it much easier for someone like myself to get into really understanding what's going on. So looking at the American Mars missions, over time, they've got better and better. So not only have they sent larger and larger craft down to the surface, but they've got more and more precise at the area they're trying to land them in. So these are called landing ellipses. And as I said before, an ellipse is basically a fancy word for saying an oval. Now, the one near the bottom is Mars, is Mars Pathfinder, and it had a really big ellipse, which isn't a surprise considering the distance you're trying to get to. To give you a rough idea, the International Space Station is about 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. That's pretty far. The moon is basically a thousand times that distance again, and Mars at its furthest is a thousand times that. So we're talking really big distances when we're talking about the distance to Mars. So they've managed to get something to get from Earth all that distance to Mars and land on Mars. They're doing really, really well. So the first time it was like, it'll get in this kind of a size area. But as they got better and better at what they're doing, they managed to restrict that down further and further. Now to start with, if you know you're gonna land somewhere in this kind of an area, you need to find an area that big that's safe to land in. Now, safe is really good for the engineers, but safe tends to be rather boring for the scientists. The scientists want the drama of the interesting geology, the, the interesting rock formations uh, to be able to study it and get more sort of chance of being able to find either past or present signs of life. So if Mars Pathfinder's area of landing was at the same size as a piece of paper, an A4 piece of paper, by the time we get down to curiosity, we're talking about something about the size of a bank card. So it's a dramatic reduction in the area that we can land in. And then when we get down to Perseverance, which landed last month, you're down to something about the surface area or one side of a die or dice, if that's what you're more used to calling it. So we're talking from a piece of paper down to the one side of a dice, you're talking really much, much smaller, much more accurate landing. And that gives the ability to go to some really interesting places. Now, part of why they could do that is that Perseverance, the landing craft, actually had a lot of advantages. It had its own cameras and it was able to think, whereas the previous ones we had to tell in advance exactly what to do. Okay, if you've ever done any coding in Scratch, you say, go forward, go forward, go left, go left, go forward. You tell it the instructions in advance. Whereas with Perseverance, we were to say, we want you to land in this kind of region have a look around and figure out where's safe. And it did. And it's landed somewhere really good. It's nice, lots of things that the scientists are really looking forward to being able to study as it goes through uh, the next few months. So Perseverance, 
is a really complicated piece of equipment that was put together by a lot of really clever people. So this is the bulk of the Perseverance team. Uh, I'm sure someone was probably off on the day, unfortunately, but this was also in 2019. So it was a uh, nice boring times when you get groups of hundreds of people in such close proximity. So here we can see a huge diversity of people actually involved in this project. We can go into that in a little bit more detail because for this project, they actually have the profiles up on the website. Uh, and these are 12 of the people that they've picked to sort of come up to the top of the profile list. And as you can see, it's quite a diverse range of ages, genders, ethnicities. Uh, having a look at it a slightly different way, I went and had a, a look. There's more than 400 profiles listed on the team pages for Perseverance, and 52% of them are female. So they're doing really good at sort of redressing the balance that historically has been a bit skewed. Now, all those people that work on the Mars missions, they call themselves Martians. But there's another group of people that call themselves Martians, and they're people that do Martian simulations. So these people go and live in places where they are Mars-like conditions. So this is in a desert in Utah. And basically the people, once they go into this rather small looking habitat in the middle, they spend their life for the next, however long they're there. Sometimes it's a couple of months, it's been up to a year, it's been 520 days in one case. And they live as if they're on Mars. They're limited to eight minutes of water use through uh, showers and stuff through the course of the month. Uh, they have to drink recycled water. They have to drink, uh, sorry, have to eat their food out of packets. So everything's either freeze dried or something that has a very long shelf life and things like that. Now, one really big difference that they have is that on Mars, the day is 40 minutes longer. So that means if you're trying to think like you're on Mars, you need to change the cycle of your day. So some people get a normal wristwatch, others have an app on their phone that actually runs a day that is that 40 minutes longer. So if you're on a mission team for Perseverance, Perseverance goes to sleep at night time, and that's when you need to be able to download the data from it and upload the instructions for the next day, what you want it to do. So if you're on one of the Mars teams, you are synced to the Martian night time, but that's 40 minutes different every day. So when you get up today, if you get up at, say you get up at six in the morning, that then becomes 6.40, that becomes then 7.20, that then becomes eight o'clock. So bit by bit, you get out of sync very quickly. Uh, so it can be a bit difficult for some people working on these missions. Next, we get on to festooning. Now, festooning is where we send artwork along with our rovers. And this was one on Pioneer 10. Uh, and it's been a tradition that's gone on ever since then. Here's one from the Perseverance rovers, that's Perseverance rover. Uh, and this is looking at the evolution of the rovers. The first one on the left, the little one, the Sojourn, then we have the twins, Spirit and Opportunity. And these three all have a flat top because that's where the solar panels were that gave them the energy to get through their tasks. The next one we have is Curiosity. It's definitely bigger than its predecessors. It was about 900 kilograms, whereas Perseverance is a bit heavier again, it's about a thousand. Now, the other thing that we have in this image is the little helicopter. This is Ingenuity. Now, at the moment, it's actually bolted onto the undercarriage of Perseverance. It's going through all its diagnostics, it's being charged up, and probably in about a month's time, the rover will lower it down to the ground, reverse away from it so that the cameras can see it, and then it'll go through tests, and then it'll go through its first powered flight on another planet. On Spirit and Opportunity, we had other items that we had. We had um, on the left, we've got a plaque in memory of the Columbia crew that had uh, blown up after launch. On the right, we have a piece of metal that was salvaged from World Trade Center after the 9-11 attacks. Going to a bit more cheery then, we have Curiosity had a penny. And that was part of the geological instrument that actually uh, has then the ability to look at that and make sure that it knows the size of that penny in its images, and then can use that to compare to the rock samples it's, be, it's taking. Now you might also see a little bit above that, there's a little rock with a strange looking character on it. That's actually Joe the Martian, which was a cartoon character that one of the team had been using for years in his education and outreach work. So I keep talking about perseverance. Where do they get these names from? 
Well, NASA actually picks rather boring names for its craft. Perseverance name or the mission of in, in its entirety was Mars 2020. Uh, and we've had uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and things like this. But the craft that go onto planets, they tend to allow the public to name. So actually 28,000 people wrote essays suggesting different names and Perseverance was the one that won. During the descent, one of the presenters from NASA was talking live and saying, oh yeah, and we put things in our, on our craft for people to find later, what we'd call Easter eggs. And this image caught a lot of people's eyes and thinking, that's really weird, that pattern. What could that be? And within about a day, the legion of fans on Twitter had analyzed the image and actually cracked the code. And basically the different light and dark areas of the binary for zeros and ones, you can then convert that to get the letters. And in each of these circles, we got from the inner one, but dare mighty things. So dare mighty things is a short version of the JPL motto. And then around the outer circle, we've then got the GPS coordinates of the, uh, the base of JPL. We've then got a plaque on perseverance, commemorating the perseverance of all the healthcare professionals, all our lovely doctors and nurses that have been working so hard all around the world to try and keep as many people uh, alive and healthy as possible. This one is one of the better known ones that are on perseverance. You might notice there's this number, 10,932,295. Uh, NASA runs on their website a form where you can submit your name and basically get your name printed onto something that will go onto the rover. Now, in this very small area, they have three microchips which have this almost 11 million names printed on it. So it's quite tiny, tiny writing. Uh, the other thing that they've got on these chips, because they're so good at printing at this tiny, tiny resolution, is they've got the 155 finalist essays for naming Perseverance. You might then also notice there's the picture at the bottom. They've got the sun in the middle radiating out its heat and light into the solar system. On the left side, we've got the large planet Earth. On the right, we've got the smaller planet Mars that's further away. And if you look at it for a little while, you think, I wonder why they've chosen those rays of light. Turns out those rays of light are actually dots and dashes in Morse code for explore as one. Because they really wanted to be announcing this craft as yes, it is mostly created by American companies and engineers and scientists and funded by NASA, but it is a global collaboration. There are instruments from other countries from around the world and all the knowledge we gain from it is for the benefit of all humankind. Now, there's another device on perseverance called Sherlock, which basically is a fancy detector. But if ever you've done much photography, you might've come across something called white balance, where when you're taking your photos, you need to make sure you're telling it what the colors are like, telling it about the lighting in effect. Now, if you've got really fancy phones, they tend to do that themselves these days. But if you're trying to get really precise scientific data, you need to do it manually. So they have these samples where they know exactly what it does look like. So when the camera takes an image of it, they can say, oh, well, that means that the light is doing this kind of a thing. And they can make sure that they understand better any images they take going on after that. There's three of these that I want to talk about. The top middle one, which looks a bit like a piece of granite, quite applicable for people from Aberdeen. Just to the right of that, there's what looks like a maze. And the bottom left corner, there's one that's got 221B Baker. And I'll explain what they are in a moment. So let's start with the rocky looking one. Well, the rock is an interesting rock because it's had quite a history. If asteroids come into a planet hard enough, they make a giant crater but they can come in hard enough to not only make a giant crater, but to chip bits of rock off the planet and send it out into space. So at some point in Mars history, probably thousands of years ago, something came in hard enough to send debris of Mars out into space. That debris then has traveled around the sun, goodness knows how many times, and then a piece of that landed in, uh, on Earth. It was discovered, it was like, oh, this doesn't look like a rock from around here. Analyzed, hang on, this looks like a rock from Mars. So they do a lot of different testing to understand where it's come from. They figured out it was a rock from Mars. It then went on a bit of a road trip. Well, kind of, it wasn't roads because it went to the International Space Station. So here we have a sample of that on the International Space Station. 
it went there, it then came back down to earth and got sliced up. A piece of that slice then got put onto the Perseverance rover, put in a rocket, sent to Mars. So we've gone Mars to Earth to ISS to Earth to Mars. So yeah, it's traveled a few miles. The next one is the Sherlock maze. So this is really quite detailed, being able to make sure that you're able to focus and get your good resolution uh, of your images. Um, so it's a tiny little sample uh, that you can zoom in on. Again, I'll share in the, the link at the end, a PDF where you can actually get this if there's any kids there actually wanting to go and try and do that maze. Now, this is one of my favorite ones and I'll, you'll see why in a moment. So this is on the Sherlock calibration plate. So Sherlock, hopefully many of you are familiar with it as Sherlock Holmes, uh, written by Arthur Conan Doyle. And one of the books that Arthur Conan Doyle wrote was called The Dancing Man or Dancing Men. And there's then a cipher used in that, which is a kind of a code where different letters are represented by these different shapes of people. Now, anyone that's ever done something called semaphore, which is where you use flags to make different shapes, it's, it's very similar to that. So this coin has lots of references to Shakespeare. 221B Baker is the address of Sherlock Holmes. This cipher is from one of the books. I won't tell you what it means, but as I said, I'll link to both the cipher and this image at the end, and you can do it yourself if you want. Now, there's one thing that I found quite strange. Now, either I've discovered something that no one else discovered, uh, or I'm completely wrong. And I do hope someone at NASA or JPL or the geocaching website will be able to tell me, because I think there's a typo in it. One of these characters is supposed to be the letter F, but in every version of the cipher I can find, F has only got one arm up in the air, whereas in this one, it's got two. So either I've just discovered something really, really random, because, and I only discovered it because I was writing this talk, or I'm wrong, in which case I'm really looking forward to someone telling me which one of those, because either I'm right and discovered something or I'm wrong and I'm learning. And that's always a good thing. So here we have the Perseverance rover. As I said, the mission as a whole was called Mars 2020. So you'll often just hear the ro rover, if it's in NASA circles, being referred to as that. And this thing's got cameras everywhere. It's got 23 different cameras to make sure that it doesn't run into things or that it can do really good imaging of whatever it's discovering. Now, on top of the, the mask, we have what's called, called the head and there's SuperCam. That's a really powerful camera there. Uh, just below that, there's two rectangular gray cameras. Now, those are called the mast cams. There's a left one and a right one. And those two are set to be roughly human eye height and at roughly human eye separation so that they can take 3D images that mimic what you'd be able to see if you were there in person. So here's two images taken by Curiosity, which has the same basic setup. Here's they've been overlaid, one with a blue hue, one with a red hue. And if you wear those funny glasses where one side's got a red panel, one side's got a blue panel, you can see it. Or you can flip between them really quickly and you start to get this depth perception mimicking what the human eye would be able to do. So we've got the ability to see on Mars like a human because the human senses are really important to us. So what other senses have we got? Well, there's hearing and there is a microphone on Perseverance, but we haven't got to using that. Well, sorry, they have used it a little bit, but it doesn't work very well in this format for being able to share that audio information. But if you do Google it, uh, you can actually listen to sounds on Mars. So what does Mars taste like? Well, with all the different equipment we have on Mars, we've been able to do chemical analysis and get that basically it tastes like salt and vinegar potato chips or crisps as we call them in the UK. Now the salt isn't table salt, it's a different version of salt and the acid isn't the vinegar that you wanna put on your chips, but it's more likely sulfuric acid. So it's probably not the most pleasant tasting, but it's similar, salt and acid basically. And it smells like a slightly acrid, gassy smell of sulfur compounds with a chalky sweet overtone punching through, which when you say it like that, sounds remarkably like you're talking about wine if you're not actually listening to the words. So yeah, I wouldn't want to smell Mars. I wouldn't want to taste Mars, but it's interesting to have that understanding of what it would be like. What about people going to space? Well, again, if we stick to just since the year 2000, uh, on this diagram, we can see a lot more men have gone to space than women. Now that is, is getting better. It used to be a lot more distorted and it's getting less distorted over time. Um, 
we also have diversity. We have uh, here we have Sally Ride, which was the first astronaut who was gay, though that wasn't part of her public persona. We then have this team, which was the first team to have uh, an, a female even split, but that doesn't really make sense, a male female even gender split. So we got four guys, four girls. Um, if you are interested in becoming an astronaut, this is the right time because ESA has applications opening on the 31st of March. Now, if you're not a European citizen and Brits do still qualify for this because we are part of the ESA organization despite Brexit and I'm gonna move away from that one quickly. Uh, so if you are of the right age and you've got a master's degree and a PhD and various things and you've done lots of really interesting things, then maybe this is something for you. And if you do get to become an ESA astronaut, you've got to give me a shout out when you're in space. That's the rules. Uh, also, ESA is really looking to promote the diversity of astronauts. So they actually have the Parastronaut Project. So any people that have physical disabilities, which would usually preclude them from joining the astronaut corps, they are going into a program which is going to run parallel to the main astronaut training program. And basically, ESA is going to see well, working with these limitations, what can we do? Can we work around it? Can we enable these people with these diverse experiences to be part of our team? Because whenever you're working in these big teams, the more variety of experiences you have, the more variety of solutions you can come up with. There is another route. Actually, there's a couple of other routes. Uh, in this image, we have Jared Isaacman and Haley Arkanu. I think that's how you pronounce her name. Apologies if I've got that wrong and just listening. Uh, so Jared is a billionaire. He made a lot of money uh, basically working on dot-com financial services. And he is also a very accomplished pilot. He actually trains pilots. So he has basically chartered a Falcon, a, a SpaceX Falcon capsule complete with the crew module, and he's going to be commanding it. So he has then got three extra seats in that command module with him, and he is going to be running a mission in the latter part of 2021. They're hoping for the last sort of couple of months of 2021 to spend a few days in space. Now, part of why he's doing that is to try and raise awareness for St. Jude's Cancer Research Hospital. And this is where the young lady on the right comes in. This is Haley. Uh, she's 29. She is a former patient of St. Jude's because as a child, she suffered from a bone cancer and actually had to have her, one of her leg bones replaced. So she is going to be one of the occupants in this craft and she'll be going to space with Jared and she'll be the youngest at, I think she'll be 30 by then, uh, but also the first astronaut to have gone to space with a prosthetic limb or a prosthesis at least. Lastly, if you want to see Mars, where do you go to look? Uh, again, in the link, I'll put the next bit that I'm going to describe. I'm going to put a link into a document. You can actually download this and do it in your own time. But this is the visuals to sort of go along with that. Uh, if you look southwest, hopefully you'll be able to see the constellation of Orion. The three stars that make up his belt are usually one of the most distinctive features in the sky this time of year that people can then identify. If you follow to the right in a straight line, uh, you'd be heading towards the west. And you keep following that out and you get to Mars. If you literally go out tonight, I actually I have no idea if it's clear or not. Uh, if it is clear, uh, you can see Mars very close to the constellation, sorry, not the constellation, the asterism of the Pleiades, the seven sisters. There's a whole bunch of nursery, sorry, bright blue stars in this area here. If you go over future nights, uh, each night it's going to move slightly away and slightly up from the Pleiades. Uh, so you're going to have to look a little bit closer towards Orion and a little bit further up. So probably for the next week or two would be a really good chance to see it if you haven't seen it before. If you happen to have a pair of binoculars, uh, so the 10 times something ones are the best, uh, then you can actually get a really good view of what Mars looks like in detail. And you may even be able to get the Pleiades into your field of view at the same time for that extra wow factor. So the last thing I have to do tonight is again, thank all our wonderful sponsors that have enabled us to host events like this, to host events like the Teacher Training Program, which has been running 
this year and all the future years of the astronaut and engineers visiting us from NASA. This has been NASA in Aberdeen, inspiring the next generation. And if you have any questions, do please put them in the chat. Again, if you've got primary age pupils wanting to ask things, do include their name and age. Um, thank you so much to everyone for joining us this evening. Um, it's been overwhelming and it just shows you what our great topic space is. And on behalf of myself um, and Elaine, we'd be delighted to thank Tim for his time and to, to everyone for coming and staying with us. Please do take your time to give us your feedback. It, it's really important to us. It's how we improve and it's also how we get some great ideas for what to do next. To keep um, in touch with everything that's going on, don't forget to follow um, the uh, Tech Fest and Aberdeen Science Centre on Facebook and Instagram and also to visit our, our, our websites to join our mailing lists, especially a massive thank you to the IOP and a shout out to Stuart Farmer, who Elaine and I work very closely with as part of the education subgroup for the, the NASA and Aberdeen. Huge thank you to our sponsors for making it possible as, as charitable organisations were only able to do this. Um, thank you. So to BP, to CNOC, to Equinor, to TACA, to Apollo, and also to Oceaneering for their for their support. So hopefully no one's got too far to go now to, to travel home. And um, one of the benefits of this digital uh, delivery, but it's been a pleasure to be able to participate again. And a final round of applause virtually um, to, uh, to, to uh, Tim there for, for all of his time. It's, uh, it's, it's incredible and till, till, we, till we meet again, thank you so much. Whoa!